Good afternoon, and welcome to the Wilson Center. I'm Jane Harmon, President and CEO, and the Center is honored to host this first public session on the Intelligence Community's Global Water Security Assessment, conducted by the NIC, the National Intelligence Council, at the request of the State Department. According to our colleagues at the NIC uh, and this new study, between now and 2040, fresh water availability will not keep up with demand absent more effective management of water resources. Well, I'm not a water expert, but I do know something about security. And after serving on most of the major security committees in Congress, I can tell you that water security is about much more than access to H2O. In fact, I was, I was commenting to Kaz Yost, whom I'll mention in a moment, that uh, uh, Congress, uh, it, it was a controversial vote in Congress to include uh, an assessment of, of uh, climate and drought and so forth uh, in the intelligence authorization bill. A lot of people thought that was uh, uh, a kind of unnecessary addition. Well, it turns out, as we'll see in a few moments, that it's really quite central to our assessment of, uh, of security and to uh, migration patterns and to uh, what will happen with our planet. At any rate, water shortages, poor water quality, and floods by themselves are unlikely to result in state failure. However, water problems, when combined with poverty, social tensions, environmental degradation, ineffectual leadership, and weak political institutions, contribute to social disruptions that can result in failing states. A water-related state-on-state conflict is unlikely during the next decade. However, as water shortages become more acute beyond the next 10 years, water in shared basins will increasingly be used as leverage. The use of water as a weapon or to further terrorist objectives also will become more likely beyond 10 years. Nearly every sector of human activity depends on water resources. Water strategic and practical importance is heightened by the fact that despite its necessity, fresh water has no direct substitute. And the forecasts are daunting. Already nearly one billion people lack access to clean water. However, the U.S. has an opportunity for leadership and innovation, an opportunity to lead the world in developing and implementing sound policies for managing water resources. For nearly two decades, the Wilson Center has made the nexus of water, conflict, and cooperation a major focus of our work. Our environmental change and security program through its Resources for Peace Project is very fortunate to be working closely with partners in USAID's Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation. They have really made much of our work in, in recent years possible. We're pleased to be doing innovative work we call Choke Point China, on the energy water nexus in that increasingly water scarce, scarce country. We are also getting started on a new effort, Choke Point India. And in fact, some of us are pushing us to get into Choke Point Planet because it's coming to a country near you very soon. Uh, now let me introduce um, the Honorable Maria Otero, Under Secretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights. Born in La Paz, Bolivia, Ms. Otero is currently the highest-ranking Hispanic official at the State Department and the first Latina undersecretary in its history. Uh, she was formerly the president and CEO of Axion International, a firm I know extremely well, and a pioneer and leader in economic development working in 25 countries around the, the globe and in the U.S. Uh, she is recognized as one of the world's leading experts on inclusive economic growth, women's issues, and international development. Right after Undersecretary Otero, we'll hear from Dr. Casimir Yost, a good friend and direct director of the Strategic Futures Group at the National Intelligence Council, or NIC, and then from Major General Rich Engel. It was Kaz and his colleagues uh, who produced the assessment at the request of the State Department. Finally, our distinguished panel will take the stage to debate the findings, a panel that includes Ellen Lapson of the Stimson Center, a regular at Wilson Events, uh, Alexandria Cousteau of the Blue Legacy, of Blue Legacy. She's someone I met when I was still in Congress, and she's made a movie that I haven't seen that I bet is terrific. Uh, Assistant Secretary of State Carrie Ann Jones, and our chair, Jeff DeBelco, who's director of the Environmental Change and Security Program here at the Wilson Center. So uh, I think we will now begin. Please welcome Under Secretary Otero.
Thank you so much, Jane. Uh, it's uh, really an honor to be here, to be included in this national conversation on the intelligence community assessment on global water security. Uh, and it's very fitting that we're here at the Woodrow Wilson Center because uh, really you have been visionary in this area. Um, and you've addressed the area of uh, environmental security, and it's really very heartening to see that there's uh, even growing appreciation for the work that you have done in this uh, area. I also want to just take a moment and thank um, Cass Yos for all the work that the National Intelligence Council has done. He will speak after me, but let me just acknowledge him and thank him for the Nick's hard work and for their persistence uh, and their tenacity uh, in making sure that this uh, intelligence community assessment, this ICA, uh, became a reality. Uh, I also want to thank all the members of the panel that will speak to us because they're really the ones uh, that know a great deal and that can also um, engage us in a deeper understanding of these issues. Now, as Secretary Clinton has noted, there are perhaps no two issues that are more important to human health and economic growth and peace and security than access to basic sanitation and sustainable supplies of water. Each year, nearly 4,000 people, which are mostly children under five, die from preventable diseases caused by contaminated water. It's not surprising that women and girls are the ones that are most impacted by this. In addition to health impact, water will affect our ability to protect our environment, achieve food, provide with energy security, and respond to climate change. The competition, as Jane has pointed out, for water and that lack of access to basic water and sanitation services may become a source of conflict. Now, in order to better understand the impact of global water and challenges to our national security interests, it was last year that Secretary Clinton requested that the international community produce a national intelligence estimate. Uh, and further our own understanding in this area. The release of this unclassified intelligence community assessment on global water security, um, whose contents, of course, draw from the national intelligence estimate, um, they confirm much of what we had already suspected and much of what those of you that have been working in water already knew, that if it's left unaddressed, water challenges worldwide are going to present a threat to U.S. security interests. This, in addition to the tremendous burden that water scarcity and the mis mismanagement of water resources is already placing on populations and is already placing on the critical freshwater and marine eco ecosystems that we have around the, around the world. Now, when Secretary Clinton recognized this in 2010, she asked me to lead the efforts at the Department of State on addressing water. And she also, through this process, identified five specific steps that the U.S. would take in order to address these challenges. And I just want to summarize them here because they give a good framework for the way that we are addressing this. The first is to help build and strengthen the institutional and the human capacity at the local, regional, and national level in countries. Uh, it, because we know that it's countries and communities that have to take the lead in securing their own water and in securing their own water future. So we need to help build their capacity in order that they can deliver in this regard. Now this includes building support for and strengthening of regional mechanisms for advancing cooperation on shared waters. We're already active in many of the basins around the world uh, where there are countries that are sharing water. From the Nile to the Mekong, we are supporting these riparian country efforts uh, in an effort to make sure that those agreements uh, are done in a way that uh, um, not only moves us away from conflict but also respects the findings that we see and that we will hear about today. Uh, we recently launched the Share Water Partnership to focus donors uh, on some of these key regions of the world 
to make sure that some of the resources are available as well. Second, um, we believe it's very important to increase and to better coordinate our diplomatic efforts. Um, we need to work to raise the international awareness to encourage developing countries to prioritize uh, and to prioritize so that water and sanitation are part of their national plans, part of their budgets, uh, and part of their overall thinking as they develop their countries. And we also need to even increase the integration of water into global food security, health, and climate change initiatives. Both Secretary Clinton and U.S. Uh, AID Administrator Shah have been very active in promoting these issues. These comprise uh, the leading pillars of what this administration is doing. Um, and in doing so, most of the work has also been in helping countries commit themselves to carrying out this work. The third area, of course, is mobilizing financial support. This issue of water is a global initiative, and it's going to require resources from every possible source. Uh, and in many cases, there is capital available within developing countries. So part of our work in mobilizing these resources towards water and sanitation, towards building up the infrastructure, towards strengthening the way in which a country is leading all this, is to be able to tap in local capital <coughs> markets, to ourselves provide uh, credit enhancements, uh, to engage private capital, and to develop other avenues and other ways uh, of providing the resources that are needed for this work. Fourth, we need to promote the use of science and technology. Again, another pillar in the work that the Obama administration has put forth. And while we know that obviously there's no silver bullet, unless we can use science and technology to really move both towards creating incentives and developing technologies that can make a difference and that we can do that at a scale that is significant, it's going to be very difficult to move this forward. Part of doing this is sharing U.S. expertise and knowledge with the rest of the world because we have enormous resources and capacity in this area. Um, and it's uh, really this is in line with what we are trying to do in other, in other areas, whether it's food security or other areas. And it feeds into the last and final um, pillar of what the Secretary has put forth on water, which is to build and to sustain partnerships. Um, we can't really solve this problem alone. We know this. Um, last month, uh, actually it's not two months ago, on March uh, 22nd, uh, on World Water Day, Secretary Clinton launched the U.S. Water Partnership which many of you that are here worked very hard to pull together and to move forward. Um, this partnership is important because what it seeks to do is to mobilize U.S. knowledge and expertise and the resources to improve water security around the world. Our, this is our greatest access, uh, as asset. It sits in universities. It sits in uh, research centers. It sits in... Uh, uh, some of our own U.S. government agencies in the private sector, and this U.S. water partnership allows us to bring them all together and to make them available to be able to provide resources and provide knowledge to the rest of the world. I invite you to, to uh, view their website and to see how they're working on this. So today we will see that the ICA will confirm that this comprehensive approach that the Secretary has put in place for the U.S. government uh, addresses the issues that are so key for, uh, for water um, and addresses some of the challenges that we're facing in the future. In fact, the ICA will reinforce what is our view, which is that water is not just a human health issue, not just an economic development issue or an environmental issue, but also a security issue. Um, and we will ensure that water issues will stay on top of our foreign policy and national security agenda as we move forward. Um, the ICA will also reinforces the need for us to engage diplomatically and calls on us to be able to do that and to be able to coordinate our development and, and diplomatic efforts 
uh, in a way that brings stronger partnerships across the world with other countries and uh, with other players, um, especially those in the private sector. So I uh, look forward to uh, what I expect is going to be a very interesting and interactive dialogue that we will have here. This is the first time that this uh, study is being presented this way. And I know that after we listen to it, we will all have uh, a better understanding not only of the issues related to water, but also of uh, the implications that they have for the work that we do on a daily basis. Thank you. Good afternoon. <coughs> I'm delighted to be here on behalf of the intelligence community to introduce this intelligence community assessment of global water security. Uh, I want to begin at the outset by thanking uh, Undersecretary Otero for her leadership. Um, this has been really a wonderfully collaborative across government effort. Uh, uh, the initi initial initiative came from, uh, uh, from Under Secretary Otero, uh, but we've managed to work uh, well, not only within the community, but with, uh, within, uh, with state and other, uh, other government uh, uh, entities in putting, uh, putting this together. Uh, my thanks to you, uh, Jane, for hosting us here. Uh, my association with the Wilson Center goes back to uh, uh, the days before uh, President Reagan, before there was a Reagan building uh, <coughs> to the castle. Uh, when I was a congressional staffer, the, uh, the work of the Wilson Center was important to our work on the Hill, continues to be important to, uh, to uh, the national dialogue on any number of important issues. So we're appreciative uh, to you for hosting us today. Before turning to the subject at hand, let me say uh, just a word uh, uh, about um, the Global Trends Report that the NIC will issue in November, December uh, of this year after the November elections. Uh, a number of you may be familiar with this, uh, with this unclassified publication that the National Intelligence Council uh, puts out every four years uh, in which we try to identify major trends and forces that could be uh, consequential in the succeeding years. Uh, uh, Ellen Leifson, who you will hear from in, in uh, a few minutes, was present at the creation uh, of the first uh, uh, Global Trends Report in 2010 and uh, uh, she's seen the seeds of that effort grow into really a, uh, a very significant um, um, project each uh, four years that the, that the NIC undertakes. Uh, it, Global Trends 2030, which is, the, uh, which is the document that we're working on now, is very pertinent uh, to, ta to today's discussion on two scores. Uh, one, the report will focus considerable attention on the interaction between population growth, one billion more citizens of the world between now and, uh, and 2030, um, and resources, food, energy, and water. Uh, this report, uh, uh, my second observation, this report will benefit from very significant and necessary interaction and dialogue between the NIC and uh, private sector specialists, uh, not just in the U.S., but, uh, but around the world. Uh, a number of us are going off to China over this weekend to, uh, to discuss this initial draft with, uh, with Chinese uh, counterparts and think tanks. Uh, we will be uh, traveling to other regions of the world. Uh, this document has become a very robust uh, um, opportunity uh, to have a dialogue uh, across sectors uh, within government and outside of government uh, about uh, uh, issues that are going to affect the welfare of the world uh, 
uh, going forward. Um, all by way of saying that today's discussion about water will certainly help inform uh, uh, Global Trends 2030. Uh, now, uh, uh, turning to today's discussion, uh, I have to confess that I'm the warm-up warm act for my colleague, uh, Major General Rich Engel, who deserves a huge cred credit for all of the hard work that he personally has, uh, has put into this, uh, working with colleagues from across the intelligence community uh, and uh, uh, government uh, in putting the report together. Uh, I would observe, and Rich has heard me on this before, that uh, his career sort of personifies the, the uh, transition that has taken place uh, in, uh, in the U.S. national security community. Uh, uh, Rich began his career as a, as a cold warrior, flying airplanes, commanding troops, and now he finds himself uh, some years later uh, working on issues from climate to water to food security. Um, who would have thunk it? But, <laughs> uh, but he has, uh, he's been a wonderful colleague for me at the NIC, and uh, we, are, we are grateful to him for his, uh, his leadership. Uh, let me uh, uh, touch briefly on three issues uh, before turning to Rich. Um, I want to talk about the origins of this assessment. Um, I want to talk about the scope of it and then uh, identify briefly some of the research that helped us, uh, helped us move forward. Um, the NIC, uh, some years ago, did an assessment on, on climate issues um, and their effect on, on national security. Uh, as we were undertaking um, uh, that particular uh, effort, uh, we identified uh, um, four principal paths that could have an impact on U.S. national security um, arising out of, uh, out of uh, significant climate change. Uh, first would be changes in water availability. Uh, second would be changes in agricultural productivity. Uh, third, damages to economically uh, important, significant infrastructure uh, from extreme weather events, uh, and then fourth, uh, changes in disease patterns as a result of, uh, of climate change. Um, having seen what uh, the potential uh, impact of climate change on water availability uh, would be, we determined uh, uh, that the next logical area of inquiry uh, for the NIC and for the IC would be on the subject of water. Uh, while we were thinking that this was a good idea in theory, uh, a formal request from uh, Secretary Clinton and the Department of State uh, made it uh, an undertaking that, uh, that we were going to do in practice. Uh, uh, and we, deli we were delighted at uh, delighted at the opportunity to do that. Um, I should say quickly that uh, uh, the follow-on to this water project is a, is a project on food security, which we're in, uh, we have underway now. Uh, the scope of, uh, of uh, this assessment um, was uh, 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 we decided that we would look out to, to 2040, which uh, uh, which is uh, almost by definition uh, uh, a long ways out uh, with a lot of variables, uh, but we determined that we would look at uh, three uh, particular long-term drivers, uh, population increases, uh, economic development, uh, and climate change. Um, I should say quickly that this is not a uh, – uh, a comprehensive analysis of the entire global water landscape. Uh, to have tried that would have been the work of years, uh, uh, not of months. Uh, but we did try to try to put boundaries uh, around the effort uh, to identify a number of strategically important states and uh, 
a selected number of water basins and in practice that meant that this that the estimate and now the assessment focused on roughly focused on the geography between the Nile and and the Mekong where there was a clear intersection of US national security interests and risks to to water availability finally I want to say note that in preparation for this effort we undertook a number of of inquiries the first of which was to engage with the Stimson Center and I want to thank Ellen Lapson in laying out the broad connections between between water and national security but then we sponsored conferences on water issues in China and India to two countries obviously center central to emerging emerging water challenges and then we contracted for a study on water technology I go into this detail just to make the the obvious point in-house within the intelligence community we simply don't have the expertise to undertake a an effort as ambitious as this one and so we rely on a very robust engagement with with others in the private sector and with others internationally when we undertake an issue like this so again my thanks to the Wilson Center and to the Department of State for this opportunity to present our findings and let me now turn the podium over to Rich Engel see if I can get the briefing up otherwise it'll be very short set of remarks there we go I also would like to echo many of the previous speakers and say a word of thanks to the Wilson Center for allowing us to do this first presentation of the intelligence community assessment this is the first time we've come out in public and really explained the key judgments and key findings from the from the document and I can't think of a better place to do it I also would like to thank Undersecretary Otero for the motivation to do this and there's a little bit more of a story to this than you may really appreciate it's been kind of nuanced the way everyone else has talked about it okay so here's the truth all right the intelligence community actually went into this just a tad reluctant and I had the unenviable task of being asked to go brief the undersecretary on on what we were doing next which would have been an intelligence community product on water and she wanted a national intelligence estimate and I explained all the reasons why I didn't think we were going to do that and she prevailed and I will say in retrospect and I think I speak for the entire intelligence community in saying this we're glad I lost that debate because when we finally got into this and looked at the topic it really was a top-level national security issue and we found ourselves looking at things that we never imagined we were looking at the depth we would and we think we found some very interesting insights for the policy community to pursue so thank you for being persistent I also have to in in truthfulness say that I just have the privilege of being the person up here speaking but in reality it this type of a product and the research that goes into this is really done by many people inside the intelligence community not just the National Intelligence Council we are at best the shepherds for these projects and and other people contribute to it the Defense Intelligence Agency was the lead author for the for the document they were supported by the CIA National Geospatial Agency by also by the Department of State INR and National Security Agency so we had all the major elements of the intelligence community participate with us some of my colleagues are out in the audience I won't out them and then a few others are probably locked away in vaults watching this being streamed live to them okay without further ado I will give you the bottom line up front from the intelligence community assessment I'll talk one slide on factoids 
and it was really kind of an interesting slide because uh, you know I come to this as an experimental test pilot mechanical engineer so this was a different world for me but I learned some really interesting things and I'd like to share some of those with you two slides on the global water picture one today one looking out to 2025 and then we had five key judgments in the document I'll go over each of the five key judgments briefly uh, the previous speakers have alluded to them and and I will just uh, quickly summarize them and give you hopefully some new insights risks and opportunities as they affect uh, water and water security principally targeted towards the United States and then some other insights from an intelligence community's point of view bottom line up front uh, as uh, uh, Congresswoman Harmon said in the next 10 years many countries important to the United States are going to experience water problems we looked at three types of water problems we looked at shortages which included droughts we looked at poor water quality and we looked at floods so one one might normally think of floods and droughts, but they're an important part of the equation because climate change was one of the one of the drivers. Although I have to say, in honesty, as we look forward, it was the economic development and population growth that were the more significant drivers as as compared to climate change. If one looks further out beyond 2040, that's uh, that equation might might change significantly. And what's going to happen is these states will be stressed. When they're stressed, they won't be able to support, uh, they'll be too busy working inside issues, won't be able to support U.S. policy objectives. And we know that fresh water availability is not going to keep up with demand and if we continue with business as usual. So we have to change what we're doing. And of course, failure to properly deal with this can result in agriculture degradation productivity-wise in certain countries that will affect them locally and affect global markets and also disable their ability to really succeed economically. Factoids. Um, our planet has got a lot of water on it. Of the 100% of the water that's on the planet, however, only about 2.5% of it is fresh water. The rest of it is all salt water, which is kind of an interesting dramatic right there in front. If you took the limited 2.5% that's fresh water and you further broke that down, just a little over 60% of it is frozen, either in glaciers or in the poles. And about 30% of it, more or less, is in the ground. So what you're left with is almost less than 1% of it that really cruises around in the atmosphere and on the surface. But of course, that's a very important percent to us as we uh, try to do uh, sustain human life on the planet. If you look at how we use that water on a global average, about 68% of it is used for agriculture. So agri agriculture is obviously the major consumer of water, and you can see the rest of the statistics there. That 68 global average really doesn't tell the total story because in some parts of the world, particularly the developing parts of the world, for example, in Africa, that number is much higher. It's on the order of almost 80 percent, almost 80 percent in Asia. In North America, it sits somewhere in the 40s, and in Europe, it's even lower in the, uh, in the high 20s, almost 30 percent. What that says, though, however you cut it, is agri agriculture is key to solving the world challenges in front of us, world water challenges in front of us. I mentioned that one of the important drivers was economic development. One of the byproducts of economic developments that we observed was as people go up the uh, economic development ladder, they change their diets. You know, us Americans are down there at the bottom having double whoppers with cheese. And you can look at how much water goes into beef to get, a, for example, a ton of beef, 15,500 uh, cubic meters of water required to do that. For those people in the world that do not have that uh, meat-intense diet, they use much less water. They use only 900. Look at the grain levels there. You can see they're well under 3,000 cubic meters per ton. So what's significant is as we do make this migration, this transition to more meat-intense diets, we're going to aggravate what is already a challenge in terms of water availability. Those were the interesting uh, factoids that came out of, at least for me, for looking at it. Two, pictures, uh, two p slides on the global water picture. And this is kind of what it looks like today. This is present water stress. This is measured as a percentage of uh, what's known as a water withdrawal ratio. This is the percentage of water used versus the percentage of water of versus the amount of water available. And if you have high water withdrawal ratio, which means you don't have a lot of margin left in case for some reason your water's not there, it shows up as red and yellow on this chart. As you can see, as you'd expect, uh, North Africa, most of the Middle East, Australia, northeastern China and northwestern India are in certain elements of stress one way or another, and the western United States, southwestern United States, and parts of, parts of Mexico. If one looks at what the picture is supposed to be in 2025, this includes a little bit of uh, uh, demographic data. It includes the climate change out to 2025. Again, I said that signal is not that significant. Uh, and it includes the economic development. You can see the situation gets much more challenging. This is a 
change in water projected change in water stress again the areas that are most significantly challenged are in central asia the middle east north africa and portions of india and again china so let me go through the five key judgments for the i c a the first one was as again congressman harman said in the next ten years water problems will contribute to instability in states important to the united states we don't see water by itself causing state failure but what will happen is water issues in combination with other issues, politic poor political governance, economic uh, inequality, perceptions of environmental degradation that's not taken care of by the state, all of those together, if you have a water event or a water spike, and it can be a severe drought with a food uh, problem, it can be a drought that causes high food prices, or it can be a flood, any one of those water challenges could trigger initially social disruption maybe protests, maybe riots, but ultimately in some states where they do not have a robust uh, state systems, state failure is possible. Our second key judgment related to state on state conflict, and the history here is that water generally has not been a source of conflict between states. That's kind of a good news issue. States have looked at their water crises or water challenges among themselves and have worked them out. Good examples of this would be uh, in the Vietnam War that continued to have dialogue through the Mekong Treaty, uh, the picnic negotiations between Israel and Jordan during many years of strife in, in, the, in the Middle East is another good example of when that has happened. And India, Pakistan have had uh, two major wars, but they preserved the Indus River, River Treaty through that. So those are examples of how we have avoided conflict when we've had water stresses. However, beyond 10 years, we saw this becoming more difficult to do. Water would be used as leverage. And by leverage, we meant examples of where one state would potentially uh, develop its water activity first and deny another state the access to that water, or one state would go to an international body that was getting ready to fund a major infrastructure project, and they would protest the development of that project, or they would try and put political pressure on, on another government to not support it financially. That's, that's what we meant by, by leverage. We also saw water potentially being used as a weapon. In some cases, this would be terrorists who would go after water infrastructure because it's attractive and it creates a gigantic amount of attention if something were to happen to it. In other cases, it would actually be states that might use water against their own populations for population control. And regrettably, uh, um, we said in the next 10 years that some of that has probably happened uh, much sooner than that. We saw water-related conflict as plausible. We didn't. We, we were encouraged by the history, but we didn't think that was going to be obviously something that would happen automatically. But we recognized it was plausible beyond 10 years. Our third key judgment, and this for me was one of the most uh, profound key judgments of all of them, related to uh, agriculture. And fundamentally, what is happening is there are places around the world where, in order to get food for people, we have taken a we have gone after our water in the local area in such a way that we are actually consuming it in excess of where it's being replaced. This particularly, this has to do with groundwater. Groundwater being extracted for use of agriculture. The good news is we've solved some agriculture problems around the world. The bad news is we are doing, we are extracting the water at a rate that it can't be replenished, and as a result, we're eventually going to run out of that water, and then we're going to have both a water and a food problem. So this. Uh, drawing of groundwater for agriculture is going to long term be a challenge. Sometimes this is caused, by the way, uh, because states uh, will subsidize water withdrawal or they'll subsidize fuels that are used to uh, pump the water out of the ground or they don't have a proper pricing mechanism for water, all of which results in no motivation for the farmer to really use his water efficiently. And the result is, again, a considerable risk for future uh, failure of the water system. Our fourth key judgment related to uh, pollution and, and impacts on economic development. This related to both industry and uh, electrical power generation. All forms of electrical power generation consume water one way or another. It's amazing the amount of water that actually evaporates behind a dam, a hydro dam, which we would think is one of the cleanest forms of energy we could do. But nonetheless, that is a consumptive use of uh, water. So as we see water shortages coming, we can see power problems arriving in certain states, and as the power problems arise, the economic development of that state could be put at risk. Our last key judgment, when I briefed this to Under Secretary Otero, <laughs> when I gave the classified briefing, I got to the last one. She says, okay, you're finally going to give me some good news. <laughs> the last one really uh, deals with some waste that we might deal with, the water challenges we see in front of us. Um, 
and we looked at what the world could do between now and 2040 to try and mitigate some of the things I've previously described, uh, one of which is pricing. Water for agriculture sits at around 10 cents, uh, I think it's, uh, I don't know what the units are. For agriculture growth, for industry, those same units are about a dollar, maybe a dollar 20, and for home use, they're up to a dollar 80, almost two dollars. But you can see agriculture at 10 cents versus a dollar 80 is significantly subsidized in terms of the price it pays for water. And in many parts of the developing world, that water is free, or actually, as I alluded to earlier, there are subsidies that allow people to draw the water out at no charge. And if you continue with that mindset, you don't develop any motivation to use it efficiently. So proper pricing, proper allocations, which, by the way, are hugely difficult political decisions that have to be made locally to work that. Uh, virtual water takes advantage of the fact that many products have water in them. I gave you the agricultural list, and if you can trade water through virtual trade of products, then you can overcome some of the local shortages. If, if someone can buy their beef instead of grow it themselves, they don't need to use their local water for it. Now, this only works if the agricultural markets are strong internationally and they are not subject to one state withholding its agricultural product from, a, from being sold on the global market. So we have to have good uh, food markets to do that. That's, that's for our food, NIE, which is next. Um, the last one is investments in water-related in infrastructure. Uh, agriculture, as I talked about, power and, and water treatment plants so that industry, when it uses it, can have it available for subsequent users. But by and large, given that factor, what I show you up front, overwhelmingly working on agriculture has the highest payoff. Uh, and the way, best way to do that is simple improvements, interestingly enough. Land leveling, drip irrigation are technologies that would make the water go, long, go longer, be able to use for other uh, customers, and greatly reduce the risk that we run short. All right, let me quickly talk about uh, risks and opportunities. Um, what are the risks? It's tempting to want to do these massive engineering projects that move water all over our country. We have done a little bit of that in the United States. I come from California, and this boy, California aqueduct brings that water down from Northern California to Southern California. It's a big deal, but you have to be very careful how you do that. Oftentimes, there's unintended consequences, uh, and those do take a tremendous amount of power. A, non-trivial amount of power in the state of California is used just to move that water from one place to another. So the solutions have to recognize the totality of their impact on the entire ecosystem. And as I said, the risk of unintended consequences sometimes can lead to social disruptions and potentially political disruptions. What are the opportunities? Uh, here we identified through our analysis several opportunities, several capacities that the United States has that we bring to bear, perhaps almost uniquely, that would really allow us to help the global, on the global problems. One of which is we have the technical ability to really be able to work water issues. We can do the, uh, the um, hydrological modeling that's necessary. We have the scientific uh, ability to gather data on what, what water is really available, either from remote sensing or from in situ uh, sensing. We have good water management techniques that we have used in the United States. We can encourage open and sustained markets, particularly in agriculture. That, by the way, would also be to benefit to us since we are a major agricultural exporter. And finally, uh, we have the capacity to provide and support both the development of legal institutions and institutional arrangements for the sharing of water to make sure it's properly done in other places around the world. People would look to us to be able to contribute to that. Okay, uh, quickly get off the stage. What did the intelligence community learn about this? Not enough hydrological models are available globally to really understand what's taking place. That was one lesson we walked away from. It. We don't have the expertise in the United States government, nor should we develop it, as, as Cass said. Quite frankly, uh, there's other people in the U.S. government, and we would like to be able to use them more often to help us for these kind of assessments. And we have to consider, when we do this hydrological modeling, what the impact of climate change is going to be. We do look at state stability. That's one of the critical things we do look at to in determine where U.S. interests are at risk. But we observe that a structured approach, and then here's kind of the vision thing. If we had a structured approach that looked at the long-term availability of natural resources, food, water, energy, uh, out in the future, we did these structured analysis to look at essentially human sustainability about every four years. Cass talked about Global Trends 2030. If that was done somewhere in the U.S. government, again, I don't offer that the IC is necessarily the right place to do it, and it fed into the global trends, 
then we could write an intelligence report about what we thought it would mean to national security. And if you think about this, if it's done on about a four-year cycle, right after that we would have a, a development and deployment uh, report done by the Department of State, and we would have uh, the defense report done by uh, Department of Defense. So you could kind of go through a logical sequence there, but it could begin quite, quite appropriately with an integrated look at natural resources availability. And with that, I will uh, let the panel offer uh, great wisdom above what I said and answer all the tough questions. Thank Jeff. Well, uh, thank you, Rich, Undersecretary Otero, Dr. Yost, uh, and of course, uh, Jane Harmon. Uh, it is uh, really our privilege here at the, at the Wilson Center. Uh, as um, Director of the Environmental Change and Security Program, uh, you, it's not surprising that these topics are of great interest to me <laughs> um, and, and, and folks here in the room, uh, but it is uh, so very refreshing that uh, such key actors in the U.S. government have taken these issues so, so seriously uh, with such a, a systematic look at a very complex set of issues. Um, and so with the, the fodder that Rich has given us with these conclusions, we thought um, in the national conversations format that Jane Harmon has, has brought here to the center uh, that we would um, share the reflections of uh, additional experts who, who plug into these issues from, from different perspectives. Um, and engage in a, a conversation here, and then, of course, um, engage you in the audience uh, for a conversation as well. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Carrie Ann Jones, who's the Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs at the State Department. She's been a, a leader in, in science and policy interface from uh, the National Science Foundation, the White House Office of Science, uh, Science and Technology Policy, USAID, National Institutes of Health, somebody who's been working on the, the scientific questions and bringing them into the policy realm for, for many, many, uh, many, many years. Uh, you, you heard of, uh, from General Engel, who, um, of course, is, is uh, I'm not sure we told you his title, Director of Environment and Natural Resources Program at the National Intelligence Council. And uh, as he was on point on this water assessment, so was he on the the climate change assessment that Cass uh, r referred to earlier. Um, Alexandra Cousteau, it's great to welcome her back to the, the Wilson Center. Alexandra is um, heads up Blue Legacy and is one of the National Geographic Emerging Explorers. Um, she is uh, someone who has uh, tackled, these, uh, tackled these water issues and went to, to talk to the people living on and, and alongside uh, these rivers and in these basins all around the world. Um, and somebody who also uh, was, was taught by one of the very best about how to communicate <laughs> these stories, right, when her, among other things, grandfather taught her how to, to dive when she was seven years old. So uh, <laughs> it, it's in the blood, so to speak, in terms of making very real the connections that we're talking about here, uh, here today. Um, and then, finally, Ellen Leifson, who was also uh, mentioned uh, before. Ellen is the head of the Stimson Center. Uh, and also, as, as Cass mentioned, a former vice chair of the National Intelligence Council. So both from the process and the perspective of security has tackled these long-term trends issues. Uh, but then she and her colleague, David Mickle, who is, I think, here, their excellent work on environment security, and particularly looking at South Asia, has been really um, a source of inspiration for all of us in trying to understand how these, how these issues come together. And so, Ellen, perhaps can we start, we start with you to, to um, to reflect in, in some ways, the maybe ask you to talk about how, from that security perspective, the value of these kinds of trends reports, and then um, how some of these uh, findings resonate with your understanding of having looked specifically in, in South Asia in particular, the kind of geopolitics of the, the transboundary water. Thanks, Jeff. Well, first, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. and. Uh, as, as Kaz and others have noted, um, it's really this whole exercise of global trends has really turned into something 
bigger than we might have expected a decade and a half ago when we started it. Um, and I actually think that even the process of how we do global trends is, is part of the same story that we're telling about the rest of the world, that issues are more integrated, you have to consult more people, you have to think outside your national boundaries, uh, and really a lot of this work isn't about secrets. It's about insight, it's about knowledge, and it's about pooling data and sharing information. So, uh, you know, I, I do think that this, this exercise has really added value, not just uh, to give the intelligence community a, a, a kinder, gentler face uh, to the rest of the world, but also <laughs> because it really is part of how we have to think and change our behavior in a whole of government way. That the integration of domestic and foreign and the integration and the national security lens has to be looked at much wider because, you know, we have human security issues too, um, and we look out at the rest of the world and, and try to be a problem solver. So, um, it, it really, uh, one more thought on sort of the exercise itself. Um, I think when we first started it, you know, getting outside the boundaries of traditional security and traditional definitions of national security was hard. And it wasn't clear that other than the functional bureaus of the State Department that anybody would really be that interested in some of these global trends. And it's not a hard sell anymore. Right. People really get it. Uh, people do see whether it's because you talk uh, in other countries or even our, our conversations here at home, uh, we understand the interconnectedness of hard security and soft security. So it's, it's just become a, a progressive process where the conversation uh, gets, gets richer and better. As um, now, on the specifics of the water judgment, um, first I commend Rich and all his colleagues in, in, the, in the analytic community for such a, uh, a broad and you know, wide-angle lens look, and I, I appreciate the aggregating of the judgments. Having said that, the real world is going to be about the disaggregated uh, realities, so that it's useful to know what the global story is, but along that continuum of kind of conflict or cooperation, you're going to get, in reality, lots of points along that continuing happening simultaneously. So in some parts of the world, the cooperation story is going to be the bottom line. And in other parts of the world, you have to really worry about whether we're getting moving along that continuum to water being a source of conflict. So it's not a single judgment to say, uh, most likely, you know, water won't be a source of conflict. It w there'll be lots of water stories um, as we look out and look at the spread on the map between now and 2030. It's more and more countries that will be thinking about these issues. Uh, and so I think that um, the disaggregated story is, is real. So let me just, you, you mentioned South Asia. Um, I do think that, you know, there's, uh, it's not just trying to talk to the governments of India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and make to probe and make sure that they have water on their agenda. But it's the public information part of it that is where the conflict driver may come, that people want to perceive a, a problem that may not inf either may not be there or may be manipulated by political actors or by a free press. Um, and so some of what I think the USG can do and other concerned actors outside of government is to really help on that information piece and the knowledge piece, you know, the understanding of what's real and what's not real. Uh, we've been privileged to partner uh, David Nickel, that was mentioned before, with um, our embassies in the region to try to bring scientists together for inf better information sharing between India and Pakistan, the water-scarce countries, so that they don't misperceive or misunderstand what's actually uh, going on. Um, and so, you know, science diplomacy, public diplomacy, diplomacy diplomacy, <laughs> um, you know, all along the continuum of the tools that exist within our government, I think, need to come into play. Um, in an area as critical as uh, India and Pakistan. Because, of course, let's just state the obvious, in a region as vital as India, uh, as South Asia, um, if there were to be conflict driven at least in part by water scarcity or by perceptions of water scarcity, um, we're talking about a serious conflict here. We're not talking about a few farmers along a border. We're talking about something that could escalate into something of, of grave consequence for the international community. Um, uh, the governance issues. Um, it is a little tricky to write this within the U.S. government because there's a tendency to still look at the map as having national boundaries and to talk about the individual political en actors as if they are sovereign nation states. 
In reality, these water problems get managed at the subnational level and at the supranational level. So you have water authorities that can do the right thing in part of a national territory, even if at the national level the policies aren't so great. Um, similarly, the solutions in these river commissions and in other places that are supranational, uh, I think part of the trick is to keep strengthening the credibility and legitimacy of these supranational entities because it's easy to default to the national level political sensitivities very quickly. I'm thinking, for example, of Turkey, Iraq, Syria, for example. You know, the upstream country, in theory, has the leverage and the influence and the power to the downstream country. But if you create a supranational body, in theory, even the Turks would have to give up some of their sovereignty to let this supranational governance unit uh, manage and allocate and resolve disputes over water. Um, very last thought, uh, the U.S. role. I, I want to just shade a little bit the judgment at the end of the paper about the opportunities for the United States. It is certainly true that over the decades, the U.S. has contributed more than any other country to the kind of architecture and the infrastructure of the global commons. But I think we do want to think global here. You know, we want to make sure that, there's, there's, that everybody sees a stake and that this isn't being done uh, sort of to accrue power or prestige to the United States, uh, that we're in the mix with everybody else to try to solve the problem. We may have, you know, contributed in ways that are, we don't always get credit for, um, but I would still look at this as that the, the group of folks you want in the room to strengthen the global governance pieces of this uh, should not be just limited to uh, Washington. Mm -hmm. So I think I'll mm -hmm. stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Alexander, if we could turn to you from that kind of geopolitical and basin-wide uh, analysis and perspective, Ellen. To, you've been down in these basins talking to these people and telling their stories and seeing these connections in the ground. How, how does that kind of lens and level of seeing these issues resonate with, with some of the, the conclusions that were brought out in the, in the assessment? Yeah, well, it was interesting actually for me to read the report because um, there were places like the Mekong that I have visited, and the, the real concern, I think, that we need to have in, for places like the Mekong is the degradation of the river system. Um, what is incredible about Cambodia and this Tonle Sap Lake, which is at the end of the Mekong where it reaches the sea, is that at certain times of the year, this river will actually reverse direction and move back and flood an entire forest and so y the the water spreads out and it actually is a is a food delivery system there's almost 700 unique species of fish wow. in the Tonle Sap and as it floods the forest these fish are delivered to the doorsteps of over three million people so right now when um, they look at what's happening with dam building and um, desires on the Chinese, Laotian, and Thai side to generate electricity, they are very concerned that once these river, this river stops flowing, the Tonle Sap will stop flooding. Mm -hmm. um, these fish won't be able to spawn or migrate, and they won't be delivered mm -hmm. as they have been for generations. And so we will be facing an immediate food security issue for over three million people. Um, and when I went and spoke with these people who um, are very humble um, and don't expect much but the ability to continue to feed their families with the fish from the Tonle Sap. They are fearful that this will lead to a starvation event for them and they say, you know, but our children, they can't eat electricity. They can't drink electricity. Um, they're going to starve and there's nothing we can do about it because the, gener the electricity that's being generated won't even benefit us. Mm -hmm. So I think when we are looking at the changes that are happening in these river systems that do cross borders um, and that have to satisfy demands from a lot of different both powerful and not powerful interests, we need to continue looking at these rivers as systems. And understand that, especially when it comes to drought and floods and some of these climate concerns, it's the systems that provide us with buffers. It's the wetlands and um, all of these areas, the, the, 
the areas that are forested along the rivers, these buffer zones that can expand and contract, that can store and purify water and deliver it where it's needed. And I think we underestimate how important the systems are to the prosperity of communities around the world, but also here in the United States. And don't forget that here in the United States, the Colorado River doesn't reach the sea. The Mississippi River ends in a dead zone. Over 60% of streams, lakes, and rivers in the American East are unfit for swimming, drinking, or fishing. Um, we have uh, very serious concerns here as well, and, and I think it, it just reflects this fragmentation of our water systems and our inability to manage them as systems. I'll give one last example of um, people who've actually done it really right in a place that's unexpected. Um, which is actually Angola, Namibia, and Botswana, and the Okavango Delta, which is one of the most spectacular places in the world, and really, I think, a treasure, a, a world heritage site um, that is uh, extraordinary. And um, it still exists because, in spite of the fact that the water originates in Angola, which was torn apart by civil war, um, runs almost 2,000 miles to the Okavango Delta, passing through Namibia, which is an, a desert nation, um, they have recognized that the Okavango Delta needs to exist, but that people in Angola and Namibia also have needs. And so there's um, a Transbasin Commission made up of people from all three countries who come together to make decisions about the watershed system and share benefits back upstream. So they make decisions <coughs> together about the most strategic place to put a dam or some other facility um, in such a way that it won't destroy the watershed. So I think we have examples of this watershed first thinking that protects not only human security concerns but also <coughs> the ecosystems that provide so many services to us that we fail to take into consideration. I think that, that ties together very nicely our prioritization on institutions. It's it's taking the time to invest and help facilitate and, and support those, having been out to see just how amazing that place is and, and talk to those Okavango commissioners. It's, it's on the one hand sad that the fact that some of us came from the outside gave them an extra meeting. I mean, they were so poorly resourced in some ways that meeting with a bunch of outsiders was another chance for them to do business. But it was truly inspiring how they found, um, found ways to work together. I think also from your <coughs> um, discussion of Cambodia reminds me of one of Rich's quotes that I think is reflective as a strength in this report, which is the security community is not just interested in crises at the end of the gun. It, and I think the quote was, I want, I, Rich Engel, want to know, and the Nick wants to know if Cambodia is only going to get one rice harvest instead of two. That matters in this larger global mm -hmm. security context. And I think it's having both of those worlds, so to speak, in, in the discussion are what are, are, what are so um, critical. Well, uh, Dr. Jones, from what you've heard from these folks, but also, of course, with the, with the assessment being right. done for state, um, what, what resonates with you and, and with the portfolio that you have? How do you see state moving forward in, in addressing these issues? Well, thank you. And I'd like to thank the Wilson Center for hosting this discussion. Um, I think there's one obvious phrase that we've been hearing that I think comes to mind immediately, and that's the intersection of diplomacy and development. Mm -hmm. Um, meaning that you have to deal with the issues of the local economy's ability to produce what it needs in terms of food and energy, and you also need to be able to think about how you reach out to other donors and other partners to advance, to make any progress on this complex issue. And what we're trying to do in the State Department is really partner across the U.S. government. So this is a whole-of-government approach. We work very closely with USAID in terms of looking at this as a development issue that has local security uh, issues as well as rising up through the levels of the community, the state, and you know, the regional areas. And I think that AID has a lot of investments in things like irrigation, which is pointed out as being such a basic need, but yet we know that so much of the water that we lose is lost through innovation, uh, inefficient in, uh, irrigation systems. So I think the development piece uh, is very important, but tying that to the diplomacy and the ability to try to mobilize the political will 
to strengthen the appropriate institutions that are needed. And these are institutions at both at the national level and at the regional level, where we, we agree very much with what Ellen is saying about how the countries who share river basins need to have regional mechanisms to be able to solve their problems. And so this really brings together the kind of strategy that Undersecretary Otero was talking about that the Secretary has put out there where these various elements are brought together. And um, we are seeing around the world that it's not only the U.S. who is engaged in this. We're seeing many, many partner countries who want to be involved in this. And we're seeing, at it, uh, we're seeing it come to us from very different perspectives. So it's certainly coming from the food community and certainly coming from the energy community. And the whole food, energy, water nexus has become much more of a fundamental discussion in the development community and in diplomacy. So I, I think, you know, the jump to think about this as a national security issue is not a, is not a jump mm -hmm. because you're looking sort of at the, the fundamentals of social stability when you're looking at these issues. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rich, ju jumping off from that um, excellent kind of uh, painting how these different issues are connected, and it, it strikes me, I, I want to ask what was the toughest part of doing this report, and was it, uh, you know, these things need to be, brought down and be simplified in, in very clear language accessible for senior policymakers. At the same time, but They're not that slow. No, no, they're not that they're <laughs> slow. But, but it's in part from where one starts, given the complexity of these issues, if even making that simple is still really no, complex, no, no. right? I mean, no, no, it, we're not, they're not single lines, right? I couldn't right? resist. No, no, fair, fair, fair enough. I mean, there, there, there's, yeah, there are all sorts of jokes on that, but I think it's, I, I, do I won't think touch any no, of them. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'll, I'll be the punching bag. It's fine. Um, but the notion, though, that this is a really complex set of issues, and as Dr. Jones just said, it really draws in lots of, of areas. And she's framing that, uh, I think rightly so, as the opportunity to work with a lot of colleagues, the necessity to work with a lot of colleagues, but it gives us a lot of levers to address these challenges. From an analytical standpoint, that complexity is, is tough. Is that... Was well, that I mean, a big part of, of that was, what was part the of the challenge? But let me uh, pick up a point that both Alexandra and Ellen said. Another challenge was data. I mean, really getting good hydrological data at a local level so you can really understand what's taking place. So many times uh, when people do big assessments, uh, the temptation is to say, okay, what is the U.S. water picture? total amount of water divided by total population, and that's the U.S. water. And that just doesn't do it. I mean, you cannot aggregate some of that data. You really have to go down, and you have to go down to a very, very small unit, at least the river basin, maybe even less than the river basin, mm -hmm. to really understand what's the demands on the water system and uh, how robust is it given what, it, what it's going to see. I think one of the challenges we faced <laughs> was we didn't have the good data globally to go make those kind of judgments. So what you end up doing when you're trying to do something and you want to answer the policy community's question is you say, okay, I'm going to try and pick out what are the themes. And that's where it gets to what Ellen talked about because it does talk about the themes. And then one says, okay, what are the, what is the set of states and river basins that will allow me to illustrate these themes? But as Cass indicated, that is no way comprehensive to what you need to go to what I really discussed, where you're really trying to make the decisions. Where should I apply the diplomacy? Where do I do the intelligent development to really make it work? But that takes data. And uh, I guess that's the engineer in me, you know? <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> but, but Ellen, to add to sort of this comment, what you're saying is that it is very complex. And while the analysis is very complicated, I think that the implementation is complicated as well because each of these areas food, energy, water, you begin to develop sectors or ministries or program funding. Mm -hmm. And it's, all, it's very important to have a, a committed and focused approach to each of these. But there also has to be a way to integrate across oh, yeah, those absolutely. in a way that is productive from both program implementation but also policy assessment and then any policy changes you may need, need to make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we find ourselves sort of on the cutting edge of right now um, in the number of agencies, at least from the U.S. government perspective, that are involved, the number of countries that are involved, and the number of ministries 
when we're dealing with an international partner or some regional organization that could be involved. Mm -hmm. Ellen, going back to, to something you highlighted in terms of some of the, the work with governments and the actors in South Asia, and clearly in, in these countries where the data that are being flagged is so important, they're even classified and not shared publicly. Are there, are there um, is this same recognition of connectivity and the criticality of these resources ones that are being reflected in, in the conversations you're seeing there? Is, this, is there similar acceptance of the, of the connections and the priority, or, or um, is it still, and, and are there, is there a willingness to engage in these different types of mechanisms that go clearly in the development and diplomatic realm, not just in the kind of securitized realm? I, look, I think it's at early days to try to really persuade the countries that have such population density and haven't begun to think strategically about their water future. Mm -hmm. I think it's early days. I, I don't think that you have such a you know, coordinated or comprehensive willingness to look. There's another point that I guess we should make, is when you bring the water engineers and the hydrologists together, et cetera, to some extent they want to stay in their specialist community. You know, they, they don't want to become political actors. They don't want to be dragged into, you know, brief the prime minister or face the press. Um, so that we've got a little bit of, of sensitizing people. You know, we all in, in this kind of forum like the connection between the, the deeper scholarly knowledge and the public policy world. But I think in a lot of countries, you know, they would say, oh, no, you know, the engineers know how to talk to engineers and the scientists can talk to scientists, but please don't make us, uh, you know, speak to the parliament or brief the press, et cetera. And that's kind of also what has to change, I think, that, you, that people have to have a more uh, kind of wide-angle lens view of who are the stakeholders here. Um, you know, the Mekong uh, example is a very compelling one, and we've also worked in the Mekong region where you know, communities along the river who don't consider themselves to be national security actors at all, mm -hmm. but they're the ones who actually know the most about the river and what's at stake. And how do you construct a conversation uh, you know, that's across those kind of political and social barriers and boundaries within a, a, a country, not you know, let alone across the boundaries? So you know, maybe the United States is a, is a vanguard country, uh, even on the way we talk about these issues, but I think in a lot of the most water-stressed parts of the world, they, they don't have such an open conversation yet. Mm -hmm. and then building on, yeah. on um, what Ellen said, you know, I, I think one of the things that strikes me um, every time I go into the field is mm -hmm. the incredible energy that these communities have in finding and implementing solutions to the challenges that they face. And oftentimes we don't give them enough credit, we don't give them necessarily enough support. Um, but these small, I was just reading an article um, yesterday about a community in Vietnam that has decided to replant all of the mangroves around their community to help protect them from s the increasing severity of storms that they attribute to climate change. And this is just a small, impoverished community. But because they planted those mangroves, they didn't face the level of destruction that many of the surrounding communities did. And there are communities in, around India that are um, restoring their wetlands. Mm -hmm. um, we, we need to find those people and find those places and, and support them because I think collectively they will have an impact on, on the water security issues that their countries face. And if they're empowered, um, they can have much more of the impact that we desire. Um, Rich, if I could ask you, uh, Kaz mentioned how you are engaging uh, other countries on this. Uh, in some sense, it'd be interesting what the reaction has been here, but also in part uh, as you talk to, to other governments and, and brief this uh, elsewhere, how, how has the reception been uh, in those quarters as well? Well, typically when we engage with other countries, we engage with the intelligence communities in those, in those countries. And uh, the results are, are mixed. Uh, there are some countries that, quite frankly, are very enlightened, really see the issue, and they have approached the type of analysis that we did on a global point of view in their backyard um, in a very comprehensive way. And they are anticipating climate change, and they are really looking at, at stability questions that are in front of them. Uh, other countries are, I think, 
they are thankful that the United States is doing it because they don't have the resources to go mm -hmm. look at this kind of an issue. Although this does not take a lot of resources from the intelligence community because we rely so much on outside experts to help us help us do it. Uh, but they are nonetheless appreciative of the fact that we do it. So the, the honest answer is it's mixed. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Dr. Jones, I know one, uh, as distinct from the climate estimate, it, it, the State Department was very keen to have an unclassified version right. of that. I, is that in, in part for your diplomatic purposes in going forward and in, in, in engaging yeah. folks overseas as well as here domestically? Well, absolutely, because I think um, because it's it's really not any one agency who owns all of this, and when you put all these pieces together, you really need to be able to present them. And so an, an unclassified version allows us to use it as a document to discuss the issue with other countries, other experts. We're going to try to have some workshops on this. We may even have regional workshops. Um, it's also to sort of begin to really bring home the sense of that national security is more than the traditional face of national security. And I think sort of having this kind of information all in one place really lets you do that in a very sort of objective um, and, and well supported with evidence kind of discussion. So I think you know, that's really why we wanted to have it out there. Um, and, and so far it's been getting a lot of very good you know, reception from folks. Um, Alexander, in that same realm of kind of communications with, with this with this um, assessment, but also in, in the, the ways that you've tried to make these stories real and connect to some of those broader publics that Ellen said, it, while the governments are really important, it's also the public. Maybe reflect a little bit about the different ways, because you've used a lot of different ways to tell some yeah. of these mm -hmm. water stories and how even through the eyes of one community member, you're able to tell some much larger stories about how these things connect. Uh, well. You know, I, I was very inspired, of course, as you mentioned, by my grandfather and the impact that his storytelling had um, on the world. I think, you know, when, when he started um, taking cameras down in bell jars and figuring out how to do the underwater flash and all these things, with the desire to tell stories that could help people understand this new world that he had discovered that, that he thought people should know about. Um, he over the course of just a few decades, pulled the curtain back on 70% of our planet and helped people understand something that today we take for granted. Um, but times have changed enormously in terms of the technology that we use to tell stories. I don't go into the field with bell jars. We have <laughs> <laughs> very small high definition cameras that you know, I think very shortly we'll be able to edit our films right on the camera and <laughs> upload it um, to, the w to the web. And that that's certainly coming very soon, I'm sure. So um, our focus has been on telling short stories that um, illustrate a problem, like the problem that people are facing in the Tonle Sap or in the Colorado River Delta um, or in some of our urban communities in North America or in the Okavango, and tell those stories in, in a short story format um, through video, eight minutes, that then can be shared. Our goal is for these stories to inform conversations that people are having around their dinner table or around the water cooler, that they can post it to their Facebook page or email it to a colleague or a friend, um, and that they can start to understand something that I think is very important because we, we, get, we hear a lot about the global water crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, part of it is a very immediate human tragedy that we have to address, WASH initiatives. and. I've walked for water with women um, mm -hmm. in Latin America and in Africa. I know how urgent this is. But we don't talk enough about the coming human tragedy if we don't look at um, these river systems and maintaining the, their integrity so that they can continue to mm -hmm. provide us with enough water where we need it when we need it and water that is of sufficient quality to support healthy communities. Um, and so our hope is that we can help frame these issues in a way that people can not only understand what's happening globally, but they can also understand what's happening in their own backyards and take meaningful action in their communities to do that. And there is a need for that here in North America and around the world. And we've, we've um, 
by distributing that content online and virally and through social media, we've been able to reach at times about 100, media, 100 million media impressions a month. Um, so from my perspective, it is a big jump forward mm -hmm. from um, the technology and, mm -hmm. and strategies that my grandfather had in the 60s mm -hmm. and 70s when he started these discussions. Yeah. Maybe just a, a, a final question for the panel and then we'll, we'll come to, to the audience members. Um, given the challenges that were laid out for us and that we're discussing here, um, what would you like to put on the top of the priority list? And that can be for the U.S. government, that can be for NGOs, that can be for other governments, so that you can kind of choose your, your uh, operative actor. But, um, and Rich, maybe that's your data wishes for <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's right. I would like to have Alexandra's access and specificity of data. You know, I mean, that's what would be fantastic from our point of view. Uh, so we could really make in – good social judgments on a very local area and help us understand how that would then going to translate to a broader national mm -hmm. assessment. But that works out well because we're actually working on a project that will <laughs> combine <laughs> <laughs> mapping and human exactly. ground truthing. That's, thing. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's the kind of thing we're we're all about. We're about making connections here at the Wilson Center. <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> Often on the stage as well as off. Uh, Ellen, do you have some Well, I guess I'm also interested in the kind of the knowledge management piece of this, of how do we not think that this is just a governmental uh, issue and, you know, I don't know, opportunities to train journalists, uh, but also to make sure that the data is of sufficient comparable quality. Right. I mean, so that, so part of that may be bringing, you know, instruments for measurement to parts of the world that don't have them, uh, et cetera. And then we also have to remember that, you know, this water issue isn't static. It, every season it changes, uh, the, you know, the, it's dynamic so that even if you think you know what the data says, you've got to go back and check it again and, and see how it changes over time. But I, I, I guess I think that there's an important opportunity in, in the knowledge management area to, to even the playing field of making sure that people see this as an apolitical issue uh, that will require smart policy interventions. But um, if we can, you know, raise the knowledge level, then maybe the chances of it being manipulated in ways that are very unhelpful are, are perhaps greater, or it can be avoided. Mm -hmm. And I guess, um, you know, we have a list of things that we're looking at, so it's hard to choose. Mm -hmm. um, but when I think about it, um, the way we've been discussing it here, I think the institutional piece is really important. And I, I mean institutions at all different ranges and sizes. So. You sort of have your community-based water use group. Um, and I know USAID has worked in sort of to understand the dynamics there and give different kind of training and conflict resolution and whatnot. And sort of running all the way through up to the larger and larger institutions that have to deal with these kinds of issues either on a national, is on a national basis or a regional basis where, you know, that's where when we think about conflict, that's where we're concerned immediately right now in some cases. But, I mean, it's just... I think that, that brings in capacity building. Um, it brings in the idea of resource management. There's a whole number of things. And then, of course, personally, science and technology for me because I think that that's just an opportunity to where we have to make sure we're infusing the best technology mm -hmm. that gets back to the right. data as well as possible new solutions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Well, why don't we, uh, why don't we open the floor? Um, we have colleagues with microphones who will bring them uh, to you, we ask that you use them so that the folks watching the webcast uh, can hear your questions. We ask that you make them short um, so that we can get um, a number of them in in the limited uh, time that we have. And what I, what I may do is collect a number of them um, and then we will divide and conquer as a panel uh, <laughs> as opposed to ask, uh, answering them all bilaterally. Kate, why don't we start in the back and work our way down. There's a gen couple of gentlemen on the side. And we'll come down here. Please, yep. Hi, Rob Patterson from uh, Africare. And I was just reading the document while uh, the panel was discussing, in particular, this section on water technology uh, to 2040. And I was just wondering if uh, you could comment on maybe for or give us an update on where are we uh, with the potential for water desalinization. If 97.5% of the Earth's water is in the oceans, you know, we can conserve as much as we want to on, ag on agricultural use of fresh water, but let's try and get some more usable water out of the, uh, you know, out of the sea, perhaps. 
Yeah, that's my question. I don't think Nissal and, and Rick, right. that'll give you yeah, an opportunity right. to connect to some of the energy questions, but why don't we move down and get a couple more? Hello. Uh, Lawrence Freeman from the African Desk EER magazine. Um, I think water is more valuable than gold in Africa, which is where I work, and I do think it's a national security question. But uh, I question, is, is there a set of underlying assumptions here that are inhibiting us from solving the problem? I mean, some of it sounded like a continuation of the Club of Rome or limits to growth, that you have a fixed amount of resources, and therefore you have to then find a way to distribute them, and pricing would be a way of distributing them. And I, I think the view is that actually the, that the universe is developing and that with man's creative willful intervention, we can develop and expand our water. Like, for example, the stress area in southwest United States. Um, we have a pamphlet in the WAPA from the John F. Kennedy period, North American Water Power Alliance. Mm -hmm. We update it. You would take 132 million acre feet out of 1.2 billion acre feet of water before it becomes salt water from the mountains off the coast of Alaska and Canada, and before it gets dumped in the Pacific, you bring it down to the United States, mm -hmm. and you transform the aquifers, you transform the stress areas, you bring, transform Canada, you transform Mexico. These kinds of projects seem to me a way of, of avoiding the so-called scarcity. In, in Africa, there's Transaqua, developed in 1980, to take 5% of the Congo River, which is a billion uh, cubic meters of water, send it north across Central Africa, River Chari, refurbish Lake Chad. You leave another stress area. So uh, is there a set of assumptions that we're in a zero growth fixed resource mentality, or do we recognize the creativity of man in the universe to develop and solve these problems? Right. Well, that, that plugs into some of those technology and big versus small and simple versus uh, complex questions. Why don't we take one more uh, and then give our panel a chance to respond. Thank you. Um, Gene Brantley with RTI International. Uh, two questions, both very short. Is this document the full version of what's going to be available publicly, or is this a short version? Um, and secondly, <coughs> how do you see the insights from this process moving forward to inform more detailed traditional uh, intelligence assessments <coughs> for specific countries, uh, namely Yemen? Um, very uh, current security concern where the depletion of groundwater underlying the capital city is a very current and severe issue uh, and various ways of dealing with that uh, have to take into account um, the traditional tensions between various uh, parts of the country and, and uh, parts of the community. So how, how do you think that the learnings from this ICA process may change uh, the scope and the insights that are gleaned in uh, more traditional assessments for individual countries. Okay. Oh, terrific. We That's start with you, Rich. <laughs> yeah. Kind of my <laughs> data look. Okay. Uh, let me start with the last one. I'll kind of work my way back. Um, the intelligence community continues to do assessments on individual countries, including water issues on individual countries. So we have within the community not a large number of people, but an appropriate number that do focus on those kinds of things and they will continue to do so. And uh, I don't think there's a week goes by that I don't have some kind of document written about some water related or uh, environmental related issue in one country or another. And, uh, and we do do it down at, the, at much smaller levels than we did in this big view in the ICA. Uh, on the question of, uh, of zero growth and no, we did not make that assumption the assumption we made is that economic growth would continue along its present trends, that with that economic growth we assumed there would be continued demand for water as a result of people moving, uh, changing their eating habits. Uh, so what we tried to identify was not a zero-sum game because we really didn't think that was either the right thing to do or probably what would really happen. What we tried to identify is what we thought were opportunities to have constructive growth and do it within the context of the resources that are available. We were not, in the end, really pessimistic about where we could go. It's just that the, the one conclusion that I think we drew collectively among the analysts was this, you can't do this with business as usual. You've got to change the way you're doing something, but uh, not to say we didn't have the technology and so forth uh, to deal with some of the issues. Let me ask the, answer the last question about desalinization. 
uh, in the technology report, the larger technology report, um, we did look at desalinization, and the bottom line is desalinization has some options for uh, humans in developed countries, large cities where you have access and you can uh, desal and get the water to people efficiently. Here are the drawbacks. Um, number one drawback is it takes energy. So it is an energy uh, intense process. Uh, we've made great progress in the last couple years of new technologies in it, but it still takes a lot of energy and therefore it's expensive. Our best desal, I remember I quoted these numbers of 10 cents is the average price I think it's price per cubic meter for agriculture, about a buck for human consumption, and about a buck uh, 20 or buck 30 or so for industry. Well, the best desalinization costs are in the area of 60 to 70 uh, cents per cubic meter. So you could see you could go do that for humans. You might be able to do it for industry. It'd be disastrous if you tried to do it for agriculture. You just couldn't afford it, at least at the present rates we're charging for agriculture. So the conclusion was that uh, there was great progress made in desalinization. We probably were approaching some thermal limits of what we could do. But of course, if you use all that energy, you got other climate change issues related depending upon the energy you're consuming to do it. And desalinization does result in a, uh, a super salted water at the end. And you have to figure out what you're going to do with that. Uh, what do you, where do you, where do you put that and not destroy the ecosystem you're trying to, trying to work with? So that's a, that's a concern that one has to has to think about that. Um, we have one other thing. Oh, the one conclusion we did draw was that uh, agriculture can really it go a long way to solving the challenges we see, at least in the near term. And the technologies required for agriculture are not rocket science. Uh, they're just some good practices that could be applied that aren't applied. And do you want to address the length? of the unclass? The oh, full, oh, I'm sorry. Full, full uh, if that report you have has got about 20 pages in it, that's the full unclassified report. I think the bottom line is how many pages? 20? 16. 16, yeah. <laughs> that's it. Uh, I will say the classified one was about 90, going in 90 area. So there's, yeah, so there's a lot, there's a lot there more for us that. to think right. about. Okay, uh, Lauren, why don't we do on in this side and capture these three questions down here. Hi, I'm uh, David Zetlin. I'm a water economist. So I'm from California, uh, but I live in the Netherlands. And I, I, I've heard some interesting comments here. And I, um, I want to make one factual statement, which is that uh, some people don't know this, but uh, about 80 to 90 percent of the water used in the Gulf and Saudi Arabia is actually groundwater. It's not desalinated yeah. water. Mm -hmm. So even they have got cost problems. Right. Um, I'm quite concerned about, uh, I'm interested, this is like a government question, so, because uh, I work on, I'm an institutional economist, and uh, I come from California, which I consider to have the worst water management in the United States. <laughs> and the United States is quite low in my rankings of water management, because I look at worldwide rankings. So I'm wondering if the United States has any bullet I pulpit to uh, actually stand on, as far as uh, suggesting how things should be done. And in particular, as a way of uh, 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 turning over that problem, I wonder if the U.S. government, let's say the security establishment, can talk to the agricultural establishment about the management of groundwater in this country and water quality in this country, as mentioned in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. California, of course, has had a water war going for several decades. Can we fix our own house first, maybe, before we go and suggest to others that we know what we're doing? <laughs> sure. The gentleman right next to you and then to John right in front of you. I'm Leonard Kotkowitz with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And another question <laughs> on collaboration. We can answer, we can answer uh, you. Back to the networking, the, right? Put and, you right and, next and, to and each other. And the question is, as, as an agency that has a national security interest and a stability operations interest, how much traction have you gotten in discussing these challenges with DOD? Mm -hmm. Okay, terrific. John Oldfield. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. John Oldfield with WASH Advocates. First of all, thanks to the Wilson Center for hosting us. And, and to the intelligence community and to the State Department, I guess, for the unclassified version, which is very useful and probably more difficult to get than I realized. So thank you for <laughs> that. One other thing I want to put on the table, the uh, U.S. government, uh, Dr. Raj Shah of USAID, just joined the Sanitation and Water for All Partnership here in Washington uh, a few days ago. Um, is One of the goals of which is to make it possible for prime ministers, finance ministers, and so on in developing countries to better prioritize water in their own budgets, policies, programs, and so on. 
I wonder, thinking about sort of this disaggregated uh, judgment of the IC and the, and the, or, or the aggregated judgment versus the disaggregated reality, uh, Ellen's words there, I'm fascinated by that. And I wonder if we in the sort of education and advocacy space couldn't do a better job of using this tool, this ICA, to get it into the hands of those prime ministers, foreign ministers, water ministers, uh, uh, finance ministers who could put it to good use developing country by developing country or region by region if there's a role for civil society in all of this. Thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Uh, who would like to? Well, I heard government a lot, so yeah. maybe. <laughs> Um, first to that last question, I, I think you raise a very good point. I mean, one of the things we have been trying to do is to break down our own sectors. And uh, in the development community, there has been a sector for health and a sector for agriculture. And sort of breaking across those lines are very important. But this, this next hurdle is the one that you really get to the budget and the political will issue where you're going to finance ministers and political leadership. And I think the advocacy community has to has to come along and do that as well. And I think some organizations do it and some don't. But I do think that that's where we are in sort of dealing with this kind of issue. And we have reached out to finance ministers in Africa. We had a side meeting uh, during some of the World Bank meetings recently. When you begin to put this in economic terms about what it costs if this is done efficiently and then what the potential security threats could be, it gets the attention of a community that sometimes isn't, isn't engaged in this. So I think. I think yes to your question. This is something that advocacy groups have to sort of work on cross-fertilizing and getting this kind of information out there. Um, and then on the, the question about um, fixing our own house, I think uh, my sense is when I, as a, as a U.S. diplomat, when I go out there, I do not say we have the answer ever <laughs> um, because I feel very strongly that we don't have a lot of the answers. I think we have some problem-solving skills. We've learned some things and some things we haven't learned. Um, so we try to portray what we're doing as, as learning together. Um, and we are working with partners to get at these issues. And we are not trying to say, here's, here's a fix. Here's, here's something that's going to work for you. What we do find, though, is many countries are interested in coming in to, to work with us to look at California, to see what have we done wrong. Uh, what have we done right? I mean, you know, I'm serious. This is, it's, it's more sharing experiences. So it's, it's not that we have a solution. What we do have that countries are really fascinated by is our science, technology, and innovation chain, that somehow we can have a very good research community that down the road has technology that gets marketed out. And, and, and this is definitely true in the water area as it is in many others. And so we're admired, and, and we know what our shortcomings are, and I don't think we ever try to overlook those. But we are admired in terms of the technology and in some of our uh, problem-solving skills, the way we approach things. Mm -hmm. I'll stop there. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just link one of the earlier questions of whether shouldn't we be more optimistic that there's this sort of massive re-engineering or overcoming nature that will be you know, the smart future. And, I mean, it does seem to me that one of the positive stories that the United States brings, the Tennessee Valley Authority, sort of early 20th century, these huge projects that, in hindsight, we now say, oops, you know, there were some really uh, hidden costs or downsides, et cetera. We look at what the Chinese are doing and how the Mekong region has reacted to that. So some of the big technology solutions that were sort of 20th century style, I think, are no longer seen as, as desirable or feasible. And so we want to be careful here about what we mean by the science, the S&T inputs. Uh, they're getting smaller and smaller and more subtle and et cetera. It may be different materials. It may be. But the, the notion that, you know, you could, I don't know, you know, knock down the Rocky Mountains if it facilitated water flow, I, I mean, I think we're sort of past a point where our society thinks that those kinds of interventions are desirable anymore. And then I, I, we didn't quite answer the Yemen question. I, I do think that Yemen is such an outlier, and you know it's a very uh, you know, population-dense country, et cetera. And I think we just have to be mindful that sometimes what starts as a water crisis morphs into something very different. And it could more, and I don't think we've said enough about health. I'm glad you mentioned health. I think yeah. that there's a mm -hmm. whole health story that intersects with and is parallel to the water story that, and it could become, we, the way the international community could perceive some of these problems is as 
a, a horrific humanitarian health crisis. That's how it might manifest itself, even though the underlying point might be water. And the other is migration. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some people are going to have to move away from water scarce areas, and that's going to be, you know, a, a big issue for the international community. Mm -hmm. It, it was migration was the principal message we came away with uh, in the climate change. I mean, what we saw is water causing people to move, and then it was as people moved, how would they be received, what potential conflicts might come out of it. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the first thing that started us off looking uh, at water. Mm -hmm. And the, the DOD question. Oh, yep. Oh, Anyone yeah. want to tackle that one? No. <laughs> well, I mean, we have, we have been engaged with DOG, DOD in some of the interagency activities that we do. Um, so I don't know how they participated in the overall production of this document. Oh, but they were the lead author. Okay. I mean, the Defense Intelligence Agency was the lead author for the document. So, I mean, there's no question the intelligence part of the Department of Defense mm -hmm. was actively engaged. I mean, I think the question is more directed towards other parts of the DOD. But the core. Yeah. Yeah. Our experience here at the center historically on, on some of these issues has been that, that uh, we've seen some very enlightened leadership from the, the regional commands, the combatant commanders. Right. The General Zinni, when he was the head of CENTCOM, came in and said, if I'm not paying attention to uh, environmental issues and demographic issues uh, as threat and opportunity, I'm not doing my job. Uh, so I think there are there, are, there are right. certainly I examples of that. And then I think OSD policy, uh, right. obviously with the climate change component of the QDR and where that goes from now, of course, is, is a question. But certainly there are people who are day-to-day uh, -day paying attention to these issues, understanding what they mean uh, from a variety of perspectives. So we have points of entry mm -hmm. in, in different parts of Mm -hmm. a very big institution to, to, to engage with. Uh, also uh, in some of the, uh, I think, interesting military to military sure. engagement. Right. That's um, a big one. Uh, if, if nothing else, we, a number of us are often asked to go just down talk. to Fort McNair and right. talk to foreign military officers about these, about these very issues. Um, when we come down over here, please, and the chair in the middle. Uh, Charles Sills, Trailer Corp Construction. I was involved in the uh, Danube Basin Environmental Reconstruction Program right. that was run by the World Bank and the um, Global Environmental Facility and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And in fact, the Cousteau Society had the contract to perform the first uh, complete audit of the Danube Basin. And I just wondered whether a lot of the lessons learned from those transboundary World Bank, um, EBRD, et cetera, watershed um, why programs, if they are now being inputted or looked at as part of potential so, um, solutions, especially interstate cooperation mm -hmm. and regional cooperation, because a lot of that was very successful. Okay, and if you could hand the microphone to the middle there, Jerry, go ahead. Okay, we'll get you and then come over to Jerry. Hi. Hi. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm management consultant. Uh, can some of the results that you've come up with be shared on the internet and get local communities with their private sectors into making the decisions of what they're going to do by economic consensus on their water situation? Okay, and then a bit more about the dissemination. Um, folks who are watching online hopefully are clicking Rich's slides in the report so that we're getting, getting as much as possible as we can on the internet, yeah? Uh, Jerry Glenn with the Millennium Project. In your report, did you say where the center of responsibility to execute to get this stuff done, or are we just going to allow <laughs> it to business as usual, or should we not do that, or it already has already been assigned? Who's in charge, some, or should somebody be in charge? <laughs> it's a good Washington uh, question. Yeah, that's right. Okay, why don't we take one more right there in the middle in the black? Thanks. Um, I'm Allison Martin with the EPA, and I wanted to build a little bit on the question about fixing our own house. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the issues that I heard mentioned are being experienced here. Specifically, I work with American Indian tribes, yes. and when I heard about um, water subsidies, it made me think of a story that I had heard recently about water being diverted from tribal lands to facilitate um, coal transportation. But on the flip side, I know that um, there's some EPA research being done in collaboration with tribes, um, specifically on uh, properly functioning condition of a riparian system. And mm -hmm. it's really 
kind of a whole shift in terms of looking more holistically and actually even including traditional ecological knowledge in the planning. And I was wondering if there are any plans to engage our tribal partners and work through the um, federal trust responsibility that we have. Mm -hmm. Terrific. And uh, a couple more. Rich, you, I think you can probably do quickly the availability. And, and uh, the report is unclassified. It's on the National Intelligence Council's website. Um, it's free to be disseminated, written about, critiqued, used for fireplace purposes, whatever. <laughs> um, we, in the intelligence community, don't focus on the United States. I mean, that's really not our forte. We, we look outside of the United States. We, in these environmental issues, we'll do a little bit of look at the United States just for purposes of comparison, but we really don't study the United, the United States. And to the question of who in the U.S. should go work this, again, that's not an issue the intelligence community does. Our job is to say these are the class of problems you have, and we leave it to the policy community to solve that problem. <laughs> Should I speak? <laughs> um, I'll start with a different question first. Uh, um, first of all, about the Danube and World Bank experiences and other projects that have been out there. Uh, the Department of State signed a Memorandum of Understanding with the World Bank um, last year, and that has been sort of very productive in terms of bringing their expertise and experiences together with U.S. government. I don't know that we've specifically looked at that one, but I personally have worked with people who have worked on that project. And so I think what we're trying to do is connect uh, resources that have experience so that we can inform where we are. So that's an ongoing challenge, but we do have this MOU and we are trying to make that happen. On the, on the tribal engagement, um, one of the things we have done is work quite closely with the Department of Interior. And while um, I haven't been involved in meetings at this point that have talked about tribal experience, is through this interagency process is that the experiences in some of the domestic agencies will inform and provide information that's useful across the board. So that's, that's what the hope is, and it's an ongoing sort of work in progress. Which brings me to the last question, who's in charge, um, which I think uh, is a very difficult question because if you look at this report and you see all of the different interests, equities, expertise, and variables involved, it's, it's distributed across at least the U.S. government and it's distributed across other governments. Um, we have been working diligently to have a productive and efficient interagency process. And I know whenever you say that, people think, oh my God, those words don't go together. Um, but it has, it has been fairly productive. I mean, USAID and the Department of State both have water coordinators. And ours is here, Dr. Aaron Salzberg, who many of you know, and Chris Holmes is the point person in yeah. USAID. Yeah. And other agencies have particular points of contact. And so we are trying to make this a much more effective, coordinated effort. Um, who should be in charge? I think every agency would have a different answer to that question, <laughs> thinking their favorite person should be. But we're thinking we're getting better, and I think feedback from you and feedback from others as to how this is working would be very helpful. Alan, Alexandra, any, any final thoughts on these questions or things that have come up as we're coming to a close? Well, sort of one thing that we haven't said yet but maybe uh, should be said is that, you know, it's hard when these issues play out over a very long time frame and the people that are making the decisions are looking for kind of short-term results or, or they are only in office for a fixed period of time and they really don't necessarily think that what's going to happen 15 years down the road is going to be their problem. So where we've made, I think, a lot of progress is getting people to think about that horizon and what steps can be done now that will change the trajectory of where we'll be out at the horizon. So sometimes the intel community gets tweaked for, ah, you know, in hindsight your judgment wasn't right. And it's like, well, wait a minute. If our judgment was to inform and warn and you changed your policies or your behavior based on this, then it's good news that we didn't get to the worst case scenario. And that's where we are with water, that you know, there's opportunities to do things now that the people who made those hard decisions are not necessarily going to see the instant satisfaction, but that in the long term, it'll make that map in 2030 or, right. or some of the judgments of 2030 be a little less scary than they are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What I've seen over the course, I've, mm -hmm. I've been talking about water forever, <laughs> literally. Um, 
And I've ga been able to gauge, as I've tried to engage people on, in conversations around water, the level of interest, the level of knowledge, the level of passion, the level of anything. And it's been pretty poor um, for a long time. There wasn't mm -hmm. a conversation about water. Um, the conversation about WASH has always been much more advanced than anything else. Um, but that isn't our only our only pressing issue around water. We have other pressing issues we need to talk about. So what is really encouraging for me um, when I see reports like this come out is that that conversation is evolving. Mm -hmm. And it's starting to evolve very quickly. And I think it's it's starting to be a conversation that more and more and more people want to participate in and be heard in. Mm -hmm. And um, my hope is that this report will help inform the conversation that we're having at the policy level, at mm -hmm. the community level, um, at the aid level, at the civil society level. Um, hopefully it will inform universities mm -hmm. and, and people who are studying these issues and want to understand. Because that ultimately is the only way we're going to make informed decisions, is if we're having, if we put aside our false dilemmas for a moment and actually concentrate on what matters and invite everybody to be at the table in implementing those solutions. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Well, that is an encouraging note to end on <laughs> um, with, with uh, greater attention to these issues. And I think we can, we can agree a, a real contribution, and I know a lot of hard work, from uh, Rich and his, his colleagues oh, and co wider set of colleagues, as, as he rightly said, it was uh, uh, many, many hands uh, on, on this product. Um, please join me in thanking these colleagues here. And um, just a, a, very, a, a, very, a very quick reminder so that uh, more folks can, can uh, benefit from the insights of today's discussion. Know that the video from today will be archived on the Wilson site. We'll have the appropriate links to these reports and some of our partners here, the good work that you've he heard referenced today. So we urge you to, to come to the Wilson Center and um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon.